morning, Jens. Good morning. Can you hear me fine? Yeah, all good. Okay. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Uh, let's give it a few minutes and see if some other people join. Well, it's, it's actually not a good morning. It's actually in the middle of the night over here. <laughs> oh, okay. So where are you two, in Australia? It's two o'clock. Two a.m. Yeah. Oh wow. That's that's why I'm looking a little bit more like my closer to my pillow than my real face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we're a bit tired. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries. Uh, the, so if you, uh, the camera is on my Mac here, but the screen on this side. So if I don't look at you guys, it's because I'm looking at the screen. Okay, yeah, no worries. Yes, it's getting more difficult to wake up in the morning as you get older. Well, what, what? I'm older than you. What are you talking about? This is. Yeah, that's what I said. It's getting. <laughs> I'm getting older. It's getting more difficult to wake up. I think uh, Australia is probably not the best time for, you know, Doing this collaborating, stuff? collaborating with other places. Yeah, I'm. I'm with other CNCF meetings and they are all like at crazy times. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we, we were in the US early last year, now early last year, but then again, coronavirus um, it, yeah. forced us to go back. Um, there was no way. So insurance companies said we're not insuring you anymore and, and there, was no, there was no way to, for us to stay in the US. So. Oh, I see. Got it. Got it. Yeah. See what we can do this year. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Where were you in the U.S.? What uh, part? San, San Francisco. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, and it was in January, February, so you could really see when we came in, uh, arrived in January, it was still like normal, kind of a normal city. And then within like the one and a half month, it basically died down. Like the streets were all of a sudden empty, restaurants were empty, and it was, yeah. everything came to a stop. Yeah, pandemic. The pandemic hit. Yeah. yeah, hopefully this year my, will be better. Yeah. So my my uh, my parents got vaccinated 
uh, two days ago. So that was that was good to hear. Oh, all right. Uh, we haven't even started over here. But on the other hand, there are not many cases. I'm in Queensland. There are virtually none at all. Um, I don't know if New South Wales at the moment. They have a few, but I think it's just yeah. a handful at this stage. I, I think they initially they have more in Australia, but they it's now under control, right? Like, Yeah, there was one other, in particular in Victoria, that was like a huge outbreak and they locked it down for like yeah. three weeks heavily and then, then that was sorted as well. And now that we are, there's one or two cases every now and then and then there's a little like pocket of like 15 and then they close it down again and then this goes away. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it works at the moment, I think. Cool. Yeah, we can get started. So. Yeah, right. okay. uh, this uh, session is actually recorded, so um, will be available on the CNCF uh, YouTube channel. So if anybody can, you have some questions about this, then you can also send them to that channel and they can see the session. All right. Okay, good. Um, I'll, I'll try and keep my voice at the level where people can hear me. Um, so I guess what we've done, uh, can you guys hear me by the way? Yep. Yep. All right. I guess what we've, what we'll take you through is just, um, we, we're going to keep this very technical. It's not going to be the typical salesy presentations that we do Ricardo. So, um, no worries. No worries. Yeah. uh, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about our background. So we, we started the company actually in 2014, we built a, a graphical interface to integrate into um, a VMware vSphere client to manage containers. Um, and we were using vSphere Kronos and Docker back then. Mm -hmm. uh, we then pivoted to the company and we started developing a unikernel. So we actually, um, Jens on the line, like he's, he's written a unikernel from scratch. Um, and like you can ask Jens, it's good that we have him on the line. Like when, when we mean from scratch, we literally mean from scratch. And uh, it was a single process unikernel. Um, we could, it could be up in about 10 milliseconds in most public clouds. Uh, it had a 785 kilobyte footprint. Um, but what we also did is we built um, packaging and deployment solutions with this unikernel because we had to find a way to package applications and run them, you know, manage them. Um, and we did this because we wanted to address container security, much like some of the other um, projects that are out there at the moment. Um, so we took it to our first customers that were running the stuff for us. And they said, look, it's absolutely great that you built this. We love the fact that you can package all the, um, the applications the way you do, the fact that you can you know, migrate containers. Um, but we just cannot trust your kernel that you wrote yourself because, you know, the Linux kernel has years of uh, bug fixes and everything in it. So we went, okay, well, that's not great. Um, but what they did say to us is like, why don't you just use the Linux kernel? So that's what we did. So what we did in 2019 is we pivoted. We we take the core or the root Linux kernel, I mean, um, www.kernel.org, that kernel. Um, we run any Linux application on top of it. But what we've done is we've taken the, the way we package, the build, the configuration, um, and the, the way we create these immutable objects for the ap application packages. And we run them on Vortal. And essentially what we can do is we can run these containers or just applications as isolated virtual machines. But it's uh, micro VMs. Like it's, it's very, very small. Um, it's, it's very simple in what we've done. Uh, engineering is obviously a bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but what we've done is we, we have the ability to run apps with security and isolation of VMs, but we take the packaging and efficiencies of the container platforms. Um, uh, and I'll take you through how it works and what we do and how we do it. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So very, very simple. Uh, when we present to our customers as well, uh, what we what we talk about is the fact that we can take this stack and we'd reduce the stack basically to just your application running on the Linux kernel inside the VM. We make the application key and the three things that we focus on when we talk to these customers is just about resources. So obviously you know, we, the kernel itself is, yes, I think seven meg at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's about seven meg. 
Um, so that includes all our tools, all the all the configuration, everything that we've built into it as well. Um, we run at about 34 meg memory that we allocate, and that's for the kernel itself, or for for Vortal itself. Um, and the CPU, it, you know, CPU you can you can have a look. At, I think we run at about 0.002 percent CPU utilization when um, when we're idling, not doing anything. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's about reduced complexity. There's there's a whole bunch of OS lifecycle processes that get eliminated if you don't have an operating system because essentially that's what we have. Um, as an example, we you wouldn't do operating system patching normally because um, when you patch your applications, you're effectively patching the operating system as well because the rollout is a is us taking an application, binding it to the the Voltal kernel, and then pushing it out as a as a VM. Um, increased security. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that we can talk about. That it 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 really is the benefits of the of the virtual machine isolation technologies, but also then, you know, having stripped out or actually not stripped out, not having any of the components of a normal legacy operating system, um, you know, hardens a whole bunch of items on the CIS hardening checklists. So um, it is really about the three things that we talk to our customers about: its resources, complexity, and security. Mm -hmm. Um. What we do talk about a lot is there's this idea that we codify the micro OS. So instead of managing operating systems the way you used to do them, um, or even containers or anything, well, the, it's the same principle as running containers. It is, you know, codifying the operating system, codifying your o, uh, OS as a code, um, applications as a runtime. So we make the application basically the runtime. Um, and then we can push to any hypervisor out there. Um, we support all the major ones like uh, Zen, KVM, VMware, ESX, Hyper-V. Um, we all type two hypervisors like uh, VMware Fusion Workstation Player, uh, VirtualBox, Kimo, um, Firecracker. Firecracker we actually use heavily. Um, and then we have Kubernetes as a runtime integration as well. So we manage our VMs via Kubernetes. Um, it's just a simple container D integration, uh, runtime integration. Um, and and that is really what we talk about is taking everything that you used to do for the operating system and just you know, building it as a as a code platform or a codifying operating system. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time about this. If you understand the principles behind it, you can understand that security becomes more critical. It becomes fully portable. The packages are fully portable because we don't ship the kernel with any of the packages. It's it's literally like a uh, application package and then when at runtime we obviously save costs because of infrastructure software and operational costs um, there's three components to it we've got the Vortal studio or cli um, this is the the runtime cli that you use to package it to run it to build it to you know, manage it uh, the kernel the kernel itself most customers will never see the kernel because we you know they, they just won't need to know of it. Um, and then the build server, <coughs> our build server is like a repo server that we also offload the build server functionality into you know, hosted clouds or private clouds or public clouds. Um, it speeds up the build process because you don't have the latencies of uploading and downloading from your desktop. Um, and you can instruct the build server to build and send into an environment directly. Um, and the build server is distributable across any public or private cloud and it runs um, and it, we depend obviously on the build server to push the images out. Um, you can do it from your local desktop as well, but then you know there's latencies and uploads and everything else to public clouds. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so um, how, how's this? Um, so it, it's similar to um, something like Kata containers. Yeah. Actually, Jens, you want to tell him? What, that, but the difference is Kata containers is running containers within a kind of predefined operating system. So they just have a little agent inside, which they use to um, start containers. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this is not having anything around it. It's it's your app and, and that's it. So there, there's no agent uh, or something on, on the machines. It's the app you define and that's it. That's that's all on the machine. Yeah. So how do you how do you talk to the 
the VM, the, over the application that is running in the VM. So you, you let that um, just happen or, or the, what mechanisms do you use to uh, communicate between the host and the VM? Um, for, for doing what, for example? Um, I guess you, you want to have, I'm thinking about a uh, file system, for example, like it, 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 I mean, I'm thinking about like something like Kubernetes with uh, um, maybe volumes, right? So you have a volume on the host uh, and, and you want to talk to it that it's inside this uh, VM. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, so the um, at the moment, the, f the file sharing is, is the same kind of, how can I call the, the issue Carter has as well, that a VM cannot share files, uh, files between the host and um, the VM. Mm -hmm. We're working at the moment on a, on a, a with Firecracker on a VSOC um, implementation where you basically have a VSOC kind of server running on the host and the VSOC client on the guest machine, um, which can which can share files. So that's the, the idea at the moment. Got it. Got it. Actually, I, I think I might have. Sorry, guys. We 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 took out a whole bunch of slides because we didn't want to. This is that is how our Kubernetes integration actually looks. Okay. Well, I think I've hidden the slide. Hang on. Oh, I see. So you you're using a Firecracker as a yeah the, the VMM right? So. And that is that is obviously specific to the. Kubernetes integration for for any of the customers that we have that run it like in, in normal state. It's just virtual machines. So the same processes they have in EC2, the same load balances they have in EC2. I'm specific to talking about AWS, obviously. Um, those all processes that everything stays the same. Um, we we don't really yeah. Uh, as an example, I'll show you the process that most actually all of our customers have implemented as far as they build the micro VM on the, on the studio or the CLI, um, they provision it using like Ansible, Terraform or VMware's provisioning tools and then they run it. And the, we've only had one customer who's actually used the Kubernetes integration. We did it as a proof of concept for them. Um, most customers actually use just the VMware we serve clients on the public clouds, uh, private clouds, and the, the public cloud management utilities that AWS and Azure and Google Cloud and everybody else has. But it is, it's very simple. Uh, Got it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have another question is uh, so this is, um, this is a stripped down kernel too, right? So, uh, so is that something that you removed some of the device drivers or some of the uh, like uh, overhead for some for some of these things that, that come up come with the kernel and then you uh, and to run some some application for most of the the main applications. So yeah, so I guess my question is what what type of uh, there's a uh, kernel, right? So what can what is what is it like? The kernel just has a few um, minor changes. I, I think it's, I mean, you can look it up. It's uh, probably 500 lines additionally in, um, um, to, to start our own V in a D. Uh, has yeah. a custom, custom, custom bootloader because at the moment Linux is, is uh, usually having like this 1.5 stage bootloaders and um, we just use one one stage bootloader. So it, it, it doesn't do any like, um, What's this called? Um, yeah, it jumps straight straight to the Linux kernel, and our little changes are only to um, mount a custom file system um, where our stuff is on, and then it 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 starts up. So they're just the minor changes. They're not really changes to the to the kernel itself. Itself, no. Um, yeah. Got it, got it. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I was thinking about this other project uh, from IBM, um, Lupine, where they actually. Uh, grabbed uh, you know Linux kernel and then they stripped down lots of parts in the code and then they recompile it and, no. and then it became this really lightweight kernel. Uh, it that didn't actually support everything, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, 
but it allows you to run most of the major applications, uh, you know, like language runtimes and, uh, you know, things like Redis or MySQL, right? So, uh, uh, no, like Ricardo, when we built this, we had to support everything right from the start. So, my like Vortal runs, we support any, uh, any ELF 32 uh, or 64-bit binary. Um, and, and the most important part was we couldn't go to any of the customers that we had at least and tell them that they had to recompile their, their, their software or their applications to run on Vortal because they just wouldn't use it. So that's why we chose the Linux kernel eventually is because um, you literally just drop the binary in and it runs. There's nothing else that you need to do. There's no special, uh, I mean, obviously the only thing you would need to add is libraries that you would need. Um, but that was the whole principle behind this is that you have full control over the libraries that you include in your Vortal machine. So um, we import certain libraries by default. Um, it's just DNS library. I think it's libDNS. I don't even remember what the DNS library is anymore. Well, not, not, by, not by default, by the way. Well, you, you, there's a command to import it. And I always run the command for every single implementation I've done. So <laughs> it's, it's by default now. Uh, but yeah, that, that was the whole idea with this. And I'll show you a quick demo how it works. It's, it, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, but the whole idea was that just that, like, it, it, A, you, you had to go back to the customers and tell them not to change anything that they're doing now. And B, the principle was that while we, while we tell them about the security and isolation of VMs, we also wanted to give them the ability to run like containers. We want them to, to be able just to pull from Docker Hub and run, and, you know, that, and that's what we do now. You just give it a command, you tell it what container to run, it'll pull it down, convert it to a Voltal VM, and you can start it up. Got it. Yeah, got it. yeah that makes sense. So, yeah. So, so, yeah, so typically, if you uh, don't remove anything from the kernel, then you can just run anything, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we, we, we stripped it down the default kind of set in, in Linux, you know, they're like keyboard drivers, uh, stuff we don't need, they're mouse drivers and all, you know, but it comes default with the Linux kernel, of course, we removed all of that. Um, and they're just the basic drivers to run on, on clouds and server application. Got it. Got it. Right. Yep. Um, this is V in a D. This is actually the, the most important part to all of this. Uh, this is common knowledge. It's on GitHub as <coughs> part of the open source project. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, and we just go through the four phases. We do a pre-setup, a setup, the post-setup, and a launch. Um, and like Ian said, we just monitor special file systems. Um, and in general, you know, generic resources like NFS, NFS gets mounted, um, <coughs> NTP, D DNS, all, all the things that you would need just to start up an application gets launched by default. All right. Um, this is the Kubernetes integration we run under Firecracker. I mean, Jens, do you want to spend some time on this? Is it necessary? The, as you can see, obviously, our build server is very important because um, what we do is we build images on the fly. Um, we then inject information on demand based on the build server requirements. So memory, environmental variables, you know, all the things that you would need to run. Um, and then we run it under Firecracker. So I, I think anybody that's, that's worked with it would understand how this works. I mean, the, the VSOC host file sharing, uh, sharing we are working on, um, but the rest should be the same experience. So the apps within for, um, your pod can talk to each other with lo by local host. And so that should be pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, another question is I, 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 Container D was actually working on some integration with Firecracker. I think it's, is that what you're using now? So that, that No, I think they're, they're doing the same thing with an, with an agent, right? Oh, okay. Got it, got it. Yeah. But then this, that, okay. I see. I think what, what the difference is um, one of our things uh, um, is that we can build disks very fast. So we implement our own way of kind of stream building disks. So you will yeah. see it in the demo. We can we can build a, like a multi gigabyte disk in in like few three few seconds. few seconds, and and um, a small disk is like under one second. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just building whatever you need. We build the whole disk with Linux, your app 
all your stuff within just a few seconds. And then you are you running it, so you're simulating like a container inside the VM too, right? Uh, or or uh, when, when you talk about Kubernetes, I mean, you can have multiple containers in a pod, right? So are you going- Yeah, but there's a, a multiple firecrackers in our case. So we don't have one firecracker and then start, I think this is how Carter does it as well. So yeah, they have one VM and then they start the containers in there. Yeah. Um, but we don't do that. We start one container per- Per VM, okay. Per, yeah. Oh, we yeah. start one VM per container. One VM. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, we've spoken about this. This is pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, do you want to see it in action? Yeah. Um, all right, let's have a look. So, Vortal, Vortal command line. I'm going to show you the command line. There's a studio as well, which is like a graphical interface, but that's for enterprise customers. So, um, it it's actually extremely simple to use. So, the first thing I'll do is... Um, Let's uh, let's go pick an app you want to run. Uh, the docker .com. Uh, let's pick on Tomcat because Tomcat is simple. So docker pull Tomcat. So uh, what we can do is Vortal projects. I think it's convert container. Uh, Tomcat from Docker Hub, and obviously this um, you can add different repositories. I'm just telling it to pull from the default repository, which is uh, Docker Hub, um, and I want to put it in Tomcat Docker. Um, there's no magic behind this, Ricardo. All we're doing is we're connecting to the Tomcat repo on on Docker. <clears throat> we'll pull down all the layers that we need, um, unpack it, and build the virtual machine. So. Yeah, we've we've got terrible internet in the, Australia. <laughs> it's going to take a while, but essentially, when it's done, we'll just run the VM. And I'll show you the insides of it as well. Yeah. All right. So it creates a directory called Tomcat Docker. Uh, we create this default.vcfg file. So essentially what happens is the Vortal configuration file is just the arguments. Um, you could have split this up into binary and arguments, uh, environmental variables that we pass, uh, working directory. Um, <clears throat> port mapping only used if I'm gonna run it on my local machine because what I'm gonna do now is start it up under VirtualBox. And I'll actually just open up VirtualBox and show you what it looks like. And I run it. And then um, the, rest of the, the rest of the file system you just saw is like stand, it's just- um, Absolutely what, standard yeah, stuff. What, whatever yeah. is in the Docker container. That's yeah. you're not adding anything. So that, that's all Docker container stuff. So all we've done is we've basically pulled it down, we've unpacked it, converted it, and we created the default.vcfg file. So nothing crazy about it. Um, what we can then do is Vortal run Tomcat Docker, and, and what it is, we'll just do this. So what's happening in the back end is we're building a one gig disk. So that's the one gig disk done, that's the machine started. And that's Tomcat running. Very simple. Um, so yeah, it's the most boring, whatever, boring demo in the world. Whatever you see here, uh, on the logs, uh, it's what yeah. you're seeing on, on the console. Um, Correct. Yeah. Um, now we, we like obviously there's a lot of stuff we've done that uh, I can't it's just easy to show you. So I'll take you through it. Um, local host with eighty eighty. There it is. So that's just mapping to my local host running on VirtualBox. But like we've we've done things. Uh, we'll just terminate this. Um, if we look as an example, this is a MySQL package that we're using. So um, I'll show you the VCFG file as an example. So in this case, it's a MySQL package that we converted from Docker again, because we can see the entry point script. 
Um, that's the binary that runs. We pass it arguments. These are my, my skill arguments as an example. We built the database on the fly, but I'll take you through a couple of settings that we, we've added in the config file as well for people to be able to use Vortom more efficiently. So we simulate users and uh, super user privileges. So if a, if an application absolutely needs to have super user privileges, you can say, well, privilege equals super user or, you know, some other type of privilege. Um, we can redirect standard in, standard out, standard errors, everything. Um, this log files statement. So what we do is we say, um, for anything that's written to var log MySQL star. So if, if MySQL writes anything to that directory, instead of actually creating the file and writing to the disk, um, use the logging setting and stream the output somewhere. Um, so in this case, what we're doing is, if you see the declaration type equals programs, it's gonna read the log files comment and then it's gonna send all the log files to whatever config you give it here. And this config is actually a fluent bit config. So I don't know if you know what fluent bit is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so fluent bit. So we have fluent bit built into the Vortal release. So any, um, any output any output that's in here we actually support as a logging output that means what we do is we actually send all log files there we can send kernel messages there so you know that makes it completely stateless basically um, we can send system information there so in this case i'll start it up and uh, i've got a I've got a Kibana instance running here. So we'll see the metrics coming in. You can have a look at you know, CPU, memory, disk without actually starting up an agent. Um, but then for this customer, they actually want to run a Zabbix agent as well. So what we do is we start uh, MySQL, then we start Zabbix agents. Um, this bootstrap option is a Vortal option again. And it basically allows you to modify the app at startup. So you can do like a find and replace in files. You can tell the bootstrap command to wait for a file to be created first, then do something else. Um, it's just, you know, programmatically, well, actually within the config file, being able to do some programmatic um, actions in the back end when the machine starts up. Um, and then we have CTL settings you can set. <clears throat> different file systems you can change. Um, what we've done for disk size as an example is very important. So yeah. you can see the little plus at the back or at the front of the config. So if you remove disk size, what Vorta will do is it'll build a machine big enough plus I think 10% yet. Yeah. Yeah. 10%. If you add the plus, then we will build a machine big enough to house your application plus the amount of disk space that you add additional in that plus command, um, which means uh, we, we try and minimize the disk usage on the machines, but also if you have something completely stateless like um, uh, like Redis or, you know, or even if you mount NFS file shares somewhere else, or if you have a secondary disk mounted to have your disk stored um, separate to the virtual machine, then you can, then you only need to build the virtual machine big enough to have the application on it. You don't need to store any log files because we can obviously send log files anywhere. Um, so you get this idea of a completely stateless application running. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. What if somebody wants to grow the, the file system? Yeah. Uh, the creator the first time. So you just change the configuration and you don't even need to do that because I um, mean, in, in AWS, uh, Actually, in any cloud, you can just stop the machine and change the disk size, and Vortal will rebuild the disk at startup with the new size. I, I actually doesn't even need to rebuild the disk; just uses the expanded disk size. Yeah, well, well, actually, the yeah the EBS. If you have an EBS yeah. one, you don't even have to stop the machine. Just well, go. yeah, that's true. But the, the the initial disk. So if you if you create your disk and you upload it to to um, Amazon as an image, and you start it from the image, yeah. and you give it um, like hundred. 100 gig um, on startup, we check if the, the image is as big as what the disk is. And if not, we just expand it before we start the apps. Got it, got it. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, 
and and that that's the config file so what we can do is uh, we'll do vault our run again so these are now building a four gig disk and you'll see how quick this goes and we'll bring up um, virtual box so that's all good start it so it started my Zabbix agents. It's starting my um, MySQL database now. Um, it actually initializes an empty database, creates the database with the config file that I have, and then start. So that's MySQL started. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, in Kibana. You can see there's a whole bunch of well, actually, this is all stuff that we're testing at the moment, you can see. But this is what the uh, the messages look like. So this is our um, our system messages coming from Kibana, from the Wartel machines. And then oh, I don't need to show you the pretty graphs in Kibana. It's actually pretty simple. There you go. So CPU memory disk. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, yeah, MySQL. It's one of these running. As you can see, we've been doing testing. There you go. There's one running. That's probably it. Um, and, then... and, and, and just as one little comment, um, it, you don't have to run apps. If you want to run containers within that machine, if you want to use it yeah. as a vehicle to run, you can just chuck your portman on there and chuck your images on there and go for your life. Yeah. We actually run um, K3S. Uh, uh, who's, who built the K3S again inside? It's so early in the morning. K3S inside the, the yeah. Rancher. Uh, no, no, no. The, um, no, not Rancher. Oh, goodness, sorry. I'm, I'm, no, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a Rancher, guys. Yeah, it's the Rancher, guys. Um, so we run the, the, um, their Kubernetes integration on our platform. And it's, it's so easy because it's just, um, you know, we spin it up really quickly, really fast. And there's a yeah, Rancher K3S, sorry. I wrote an article on it to show how we do it. Okay. Um, and it's basically, you, you can have a Kubernetes platform from scratch in like a couple of seconds um, because you can just follow these steps. We convert Kubernetes, uh, sorry, K3S and we run it up in Voltal. And essentially we have this running in like a Mac or we push it to VMware, uh, to AWS or Google Cloud and those places and people just use it. Yeah, yeah. So is this, a, I mean, the, the use case, um, edge type of applications where you want to run K3S uh, in a VM or something? Yeah, edge. exactly, yeah. Um, the, the whole reason we, we're doing this is like the, the people that we work with are the larger ISVs um, who the, they, they don't necessarily want to run Kubernetes to, you know, they don't want to run Kubernetes to manage four, four containers. Um, and they already have virtualization platforms built on it like KVM and Zen and all those things. So, you know, this is a <laughs> extremely lightweight alternative to run a container um, as an isolated virtual machine. Well, isolation, of course. Of course, isolation security is a big thing. Um, but it also, you know, the whole premise of this is that we integrate into Kubernetes eventually so you can run a mix of the containers and the virtual machines um, without losing the interoperability between the two. And you mentioned. Sorry, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I I have a question here. This is Rob. Right. Um, okay. <clears throat> so um, it's very interesting what you guys are doing. Um, I got a question in regards to the workflow. Um, it's possible to get um, a Docker image from Docker Hub and, um, and build the VM. I understood that. Is there anything that you guys are working on the other direction for example let's say that you make some changes to your vm um would it be possible to somehow um you know save that content back into that docker image that you initially started from Second, i mean it's the opposite that, direction uh, well you could only you can always um in 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 theory if you use it as a base start with um uh, Docker file in that direction because but at the end the first step we are doing we're just taking the whatever Docker has um, 
as a file system and go through the same steps when they start a container. Mm -hmm. You could you could add, a, add your Docker file there and start from what what is it called from the the nothing in it image um, from empty or something I think it is, um, but you can you can still do your, the conversion um, all the time. So you push to Docker and then yeah. you, can, you can convert and run it. Um, that would probably be uh, the, the easier way. Although once it's converted, you can again you can add, add your Docker file to that directory and just say you know add all these files and. And, and that's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm more concerned. In, I mean, I guess is what I'm trying to get at is how do I reuse this? Let's say that you have that VM, you make a bunch of changes in that VM, you, you still keep Kubel, you launch your cluster. Um, how do you snapshot that? How do you save that? I guess that your VM image is already there, but that VM image now is going to be your environment. You will need to move that image everywhere you go, right? That's your source of information at this point. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's why we had the build server originally, um, because the build server has like a repository built into it as well. So um, I, I should actually uh, auto repositories list. So uh, auto repository connections. Yes, so I can't even remember. There you go. So. Um, there's a couple of repos that we have, like in AWS or there's a dev repo, and you can push packages into and out of these repos. It's the same as a Docker Hub, basically. Um, but yeah, th this is okay. stuff that runs somewhere outside. Um, you can easily just download them, unpack them, and run them. I mean, it's... This is um, a repo of... Um, virtual disk images that you're seeing. Right? Yeah, it's actually not virtual disk images. It's, it's the it's the packages. So okay, let me show you how this works. Um, if I take this MySQL as an example, example, what I can do is packages uh, pack MySQL, um, and what it'll do is it'll actually create a, a volatile MySQL package. Eventually. Okay. okay. I've lost connection. Well, it's going. Um, so yeah, that, that's the whole principle behind this. I got it. I got it. Thank yeah. you. Anything else? I mean, the, the demo is pretty, it, it is, it's so simple, but, and it's so boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's, yeah, it's, it's really powerful. What's going on here? Is there any constraint in terms of the images that you can pull from Docker Hub and convert? Let's say that you have a, a previous container image um, or just an image that is suspected to be launched as a privileged container uh, and it has a Docker in Docker, for example, uh, in there. Um, is there any constraint you know, um, when you launch your converter or your compiler, whatever you call it, um, mm -hmm. is there any constraint in terms of which images you can source actually not not that we are aware of um and again because we are, we are getting whatever is in that um image file and on docker hub and and getting all the commands uh, it's supposed to run with the environment variables and everything um and so far we have i think um all the stuff in the linux kernel enabled in in our um in a d that everything should run um yeah, you know, it's IT. There might be something which doesn't, but um, so far, um, I haven't seen any. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I can show you a couple of things. Um, so this is an example is our, oh, sorry. This is how we mount uh, NFS as an example. So at startup, we mount the NFS and uh, you know, you can write to your heart's content on the NFS. Um, it's, yeah, it, we, we try to make this as bulletproof as possible. Um, yeah, and actually, just as simple as possible to use. We've, we've got a whole bunch of um, apps that we've tested and tried and used. And most of them are all Docker converted apps just because we don't want to keep rebuilding things. Um, if, you, if you do want to build your own app, um, oh, let's uh, 
there, there's things like S trace built into it. It's probably better if like if you have a look at the docs. Um, yeah, the debugging side of it. Uh, you can run shell scripts, and what we do with the shell scripts is we we actually include um, BusyBox, I think, Jens. Yeah, with yeah. BusyBox. Um, if you run it with a shell command, it'll actually execute shell commands for you. Uh, you we've built in S trace, so if you start up the program with S trace set to true, we'll actually run an S trace on the app. So if you are missing a library or you know, there's some obscure library that gets called, um, we'll highlight it to you. Highlight it for you. Um, well, if if you know what S trace does, you'll work out what S trace how we do it. Um, we've got something called the import shared objects. So if you if you run both our project space import shared objects on the on a, a Linux machine, um, what we'll do is we'll import the shared objects from your Linux host that you're running it on into the Volta package. Um, and those shared objects are typically like like I said the lib libraries for DNS. Um, the dynamic linker, Jens, is that right? Yeah, yeah and I think it was it, 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 it was not like explicitly said when it starts up. We don't have any shared object. There's yeah. like if you create your disk, there's nothing on this disk. We have like the first uh, partition, which is with our stuff, and it's you can't mount it and nothing. It's um some the magic, and then the, the disk you use, there's nothing on there. So if you, for example, just do go lang and you do a static link and you want to run this app, then it's only this app is on that disk. There's no shared libraries, there's no linker, there's nothing. Yeah. No shell scripts, there are no users, there are no groups. Actually, you can see it in Minio. Uh, this is Minio that we run, and you can see there's only a Minio um, binary in there, nothing else. We, we don't even, yeah, they, literally with Minio, it's just a self contained binary. There's nothing in there, absolutely nothing else. So it, it really is for us about like, well, it, it, it's about running as lean and small as possible um, and not putting the onus back on the user to try and work out what to do. Um, there'll be there'll be outliers where, you know, you have to run S trace to find some obscure library that gets called. Um, but in most cases, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, one quick question. Um, I'm not sure if you guys covered this, but is it possible to run from a Docker file, import the image not from Docker Hub, but just from a recipe file? Oh, you, oh, you can import from your local Docker, um, um, local uh, Docker uh, slash container D. Um, so you can convert from your local um, what's the service? What's it called? Yeah, from your local Docker or your local container D. Uh, I mean, I was not referring to my local image. I'm just talking about if you can convert or import the image from a Docker file itself, from the file, you know, from the just, recipe oh, file. Oh, no. Oh, no, not, no, not from the not recipe just, file. No, no. No, it's not, not in yet. Oh, okay, got we'll always, 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 always room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. Of course, of course. No, I understand that. <laughs> in a question, so I don't uh, Anybody else has another question? So, uh, but um, with Kubernetes, do you actually have uh, anything specific on the YAML configuration to run it, or, or this is just very like um, uh, straightforward? Basically, you you just kind of the way you configure it, you just you don't need anything. It, it it's actually transparent to users. It's it's yeah. There there are a few things in uh, when you run this when uh, your machines start up in Kubernetes which you don't see. Uh, for example, we wanted to support um, that all the virtual machines see each other as local house. So um, we are doing some 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 magic, of course. Uh, that if you in the virtual machine said local host port eighty eight or something, you end up on a different virtual machine. Um, on port 88, there's some some magic in the background, but you don't have to change your YAML file. Whatever needs to be done in the Kubernetes environment, we change on the fly. Got it, got it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. That's it. I think um, you get the gist of it. Though. Yeah, you can you can download it and go play with it. It's uh, It's all there. Uh, another question. Simple. Yeah, another question is: uh, Are you 
are you planning to maybe uh, donate some of this to uh, a foundation like the CNCF uh, to get more traction or there's no plans uh, yet? The, well, it's, it's, it's open source. I didn't know that this is actually a, oh, I think we are not aware of the um, yeah. different pathways into CNCF. I think that's, let's uh, take let's it. Let's answer one. you that way, yeah. So with that question, I would say I wouldn't even know that this is a, a thing. <laughs> yeah, because I mean the the CNCF, the you know they host the projects, right? And there's uh, or there are different stages uh, for the projects. You know, there's a sandbox, there's incubation, there's a graduated stage, and um, so the idea is just to have a project hosted on a neutral foundation. Of course, the open source components, right? Not not anything proprietary, uh, but um, uh, the idea the idea there is to you know help uh, the projects you know get gain more traction and more um, contributors and 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 uh, also more users, right? So um, yeah, so and and, and I, I just brought it up as maybe something to consider right in the future if you if you're interested, right? So. Yeah, why not? I mean, it, we, we've already given some parts of it away as open source in any case, so we, we're fine with that. If, if you can tell us who to speak to, Ricardo, we're happy to do that. Yeah, so there's, um, if you look at the, the meeting notes, there's a hmm? sandbox application process, so you can follow that link and, uh, and maybe, yeah, in probably go from there but if, if you have any questions it's you can you can ask me yeah or anybody anybody from the cncf uh, staff okay yeah guys no, i gotta stay about interesting stuff and bye bye all right cheers all right see you bye thanks okay yeah we'll we'll take it away as a note and what we'll do is um yeah when when we 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 go. We're gonna go back to bed now. Sleep for another three hours, and then we'll send you an email and ask you how we how we get into that that part of the program. We'll yeah, yeah, do that. yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's something to consider, right? Uh, but I think it's uh, yeah, I think it's uh, good stuff. I mean, it's uh, useful. I think uh, um, you know people um, want to streamline how they run. Uh, you know, some of the uh, Isolated VMs and with uh, Kubernetes, um, and then I mean I've been working with the Kata Containers project quite a bit too. But uh, but I see uh, some of the differences here where where it's all packaged up, and then it may be you know more of a better use case who, for um, people who want to have uh, uh, maybe that faster. Uh, experience you know when, when they have mm -hmm. everything packaged right so yeah for us the card the only problem with card containers we well the problem for us with card containers was the fact that they use agents because we said from the start that we never want to use an agent ever in any of our solutions yeah so it's, it's a different I guess it's a different approach and yeah yeah my, that, my, and, and yeah, an agent is is i think it's easier because at the end of the day you just mm -hmm. like forward the requests within the pod to your one vm and then the rest is just what it was before pretty much right um whereas the networking setup was a little bit more difficult um if you run right. multiple vms within that pod yeah 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 cool all right all right thanks a lot Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Thanks. Well, uh, keep in touch. Yeah, we'll send All that. Right. Uh, we'll send that follow up email. I'll ask yeah, you how we do it. Stay healthy. All right. We'll do. You too. All we'll right. See you. Cheers. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.